The late 90s through early 2000s were a strange time for comic book movies. It seemed that DC and Warner Brothers had screwed the pooch with Batman and Robin, but Marvel superheroes seemed to be having something of an emergence in Hollywood, with Blade and the X-Men, and Spider-Man would go on to follow. Now back then, comic book movies weren't quite like they are today. There was no guarantee of a faithful depiction of these characters, be it their costumes or be it their personalities. More larger than life and outrageous concepts tended to be toned down a little bit for the movie going audience. A prime example of this is the appearance of the X-Men, as the iconic X-Men looks were traded in for black leather uniforms. As a matter of fact, everything seemed to be black leather. Blade, I mean, I guess that's appropriate. The X-Men, Batman. This was not really a time for the colorful superhero, and yet Spider-Man would be making his big screen debut. So the result could have been pretty much anything. So looking at Spider-Man face value, what this character looks like, how he appears, is very much the visual embodiment of what this film was at the time. As in a superhero film climate where everyone was sporting black leather, in comes Spider-Man. And it's not just that he was red and blue, it was the fact that while Spider-Man clearly had the Hollywood treatment, he was immediately recognisable as to what Spider-Man is in the comic books and other media. I've seen people on Twitter trying to claim that this suit looks nothing like the comic books, but uh... People will just say any old shit for clout, won't they really? Spider-Man was also a massive showcase of what special effects could do at the time. Comic book superheroes are often associated with thrills and spills and big action set pieces, so it's safe to say that Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2002 had its work cut out for it. Things back then weren't like what they are today, where, you know, if you can dream it, you can make it happen through the use of computer imagery. There were certain limitations, which Spider-Man 2002 did not shy away from opening up with a big spectacular musical overture showcasing many different special effects. A completely computer-generated opening credit sequence, and yeah, it shows some of its age, but it's also pretty stylish as well. It wasn't so much the CGI in isolation so much as it was how they utilised it that made this work. Moving into the film itself, it definitely draws less of its beats and inspiration from the respective Blade and X-Men movies. Moreover, it takes most of its inspiration from 1978's Superman. Which makes sense as there are quite a few similarities between Superman and Spider-Man. Both of these characters carry a great deal of American idealism. So going with the Richard Donner approach definitely made sense for this one. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1 is so overrated! One of the greatest critics of all time, Doug Walker, said that these films were cheesy and hokey. Thanks to his brilliant assessment, this is now my opinion as well, because the film is so corny and cheesy. So you want to know something that aggravates me is when people mistake idealism and innocence for being cheesy and corny. Going for this tone was a conscious decision. Sam Raimi clearly wanted just as much to pay tribute to Spider-Man as he did adapt it. Even in the early 2000s when this released, this film was very optimistic, very idealistic, and very innocent. Peter Parker didn't want to get with Mary Jane in this film because She's a woman he has a rich emotional connection with. They both have the exact same origins. She's very useful to the plot, you see. She very much ties into the greater threat. No, she's, um, she's been the girl next door his entire life, and, uh, she was probably the cause of his very first direction. A major theme of this film is innocence. Wow, what a weird couple of points to put back to back like that. But in very much like the first 40 or so minutes of this film, Peter Parker is that young idealistic fella. His biggest aspirations are that he wants to impress the girl next door with a fancy car. He's awkward, he's goofy, and pretty much daydreaming throughout his entire life. And there's very much this sort of sickly, sweet, homely quality to all of the Peter Parker scenes at home prior to becoming Spider-Man. Which is where the whole theme of innocence comes into play, it's childhood innocence. Peter Parker is a kid in this movie. You might not believe it given Tobey Maguire's age at the time, but this was par the course back then. It's 
It's called suspension of disbelief, guys. Come on, use it. You have it, use it. Don't be lazy. I, for one, you know, I, I am a zoomer and all, but I find it very easy to look past the fact that most of these actors are in their 30s. Okay, this film does show its age in some places. A lot of these uh, sequences at high school almost feel like a Blink-182 music video. But I say that in the most nice and loving way possible because I genuinely love that and I would be more than happy for us to return to that style of filmmaking, please and thank you. We very much juxtaposed the homely and innocent life of Peter Parker with the life of Norman Osborn, where business comes first and human safety be damned. He's no everyman trying to save money for a car to impress the girl. He's fulfilling weaponry contracts for a military organization. And where the characters of Norman Osborn and Peter Parker kind of overlap is A, in their interest in science, and B, Harry Osborn, the daughter daughter? The son of Norman. What the fuck is wrong with me today? Who also happens to be Peter's very best friend. All of this is breezily established in the very first act of the film. I'm genuinely surprised by how quickly this swishes by. It doesn't feel like it misses anything though, like it's a very breezily paced film. Now all of the beats of the Spider-Man origin story are here, with the one and only omission being Peter Parker creating mechanical web shooters, but if anything, that's fine, it streamlines the process, he gets all of his powers from the spider bite, whatever, no biggie. But that's really the only deviation here, I think making Spider-Man 2002 the most comic book faithful superhero Hollywood movie adaptation of its time. I mean, there's other little things coming up, but we'll talk about those in a bit. All of the story beats are there of Peter Parker's origin, spider bite, death of Uncle Ben, but all of these things are absolutely drenched in moments that enrich the characters, such as before getting bit by the radioactive spider, Peter Parker is taking photography of Mary Jane. And he's being all shy and awkward, and the way he discovers his powers happens to be in relation to beating up Flash Thompson. Which Uncle Ben finds out about, which leads to the Great Power, Great Responsibility speech, which is a major theme in this movie. The power, the responsibility. Which obviously leads to Peter making a poor judgement call at the wrestling scene, which might I say is just brilliant cinema. Just everything about the way that Sam Raimi directs this movie and this scene in particular is just absolutely bristling with energy and atmosphere, raw enthusiasm and excitement, and it just feels so very American. Just crowds and crowds of people going absolutely nuts over a guy getting beaten up in a cage. I just, it's just like you follow that up then with Peter getting stitched up out of money and then a security guard getting pissed off at an ordinary citizen for not chasing down a robber. I just, it, it just does not get more American than that. Oh, fuck me, I'm in trouble. And then of course we have the death of Uncle Ben where Peter Parker effectively loses that sense of innocence. He has to be a responsible adult now. He no longer has Uncle Ben to look out for him. And he's learned the hard way that this dream teen world he's living in, where he has wet dreams about Mary Jane Watson and wants to buy a car and stuff, it has its consequences. He has to get his head in the real world now and see where there are going to be consequences, and not just for him, but for the people that he loves. And he sees why that's unfair. And then of course we also have Norman Osborn being pressured into becoming the Green Goblin effectively, acting irresponsibly. These two actions of irresponsibility transform Peter Parker and Norman Osborn into their respective roles in this movie, the protagonist and the antagonist. Osborn out to seek revenge on the world that pressured him into becoming the Green Goblin, and Parker out to make things right, to amend for his previous mistake. Two ideologies at war with one another, with all of their loved ones and New York City in the crossfire. Now of course you've got to remember that Peter Parker is a teenager in this story, and there's always the temptation to act irresponsibly. To abandon the path of righteousness and just have what he wants. And Peter Parker does have that inclination. 
when as Spider-Man, against any and all better judgement, he has a little smoochy smoochy with the girl of his dreams, even though she's dating his best friend at this time. It's not like a serious relationship or anything, don't worry, Peter Parker's not a horrible person in this instance. But Spider-Man is a human, he's not this unbreakable force. He's a guy with wants and desires, he doesn't want to always go the hard way about things. Also that kiss scene is just iconic, I mean, like, Jesus. It basically just summarizes all of Peter's kind of growing up, becoming a man. The loss of innocence and the blossoming of Peter Parker and Mary Jane. And if you can guess what the rain is a metaphor for, congratulations, you're pretty fucking gross. No shame, so am I. But it's just nice to see that there's more to Peter Parker than the mission. He's definitely one of the more human superheroes we've had since 1978 Superman on the big screen. And this does get tested throughout the film, as Norman Osborn does try to extend an olive branch to Peter, making the offer for Spider-Man and the Green Goblin to become something of a duo to work together. The Green Goblin constantly trying to break Spider-Man. Not kill him, but destroy everything that he represents. Sure, there's incredible stunts and action going on in the scenes of Spider-Man fighting the Green Goblin, but every one of them past that initial first meet represents the Green Goblin testing Peter Parker. Make no mistake, unlike a lot of the 70s stuff that Marvel pushed out, this isn't just a stunt show spectacular, come to think of it. They probably shouldn't have relied on that back in the 70s either, because I mean like they had a fucking budget of what, $10? Put it this way, if you want a stunt show spectacular out of this, good news, you're in luck. But if you want something more, also good news, you're also in luck. It is the best of both worlds, as every action sequence plays into this thematically. We've also got the scene where Norman Osborn uncovers Peter Parker's identity as Spider-Man, which really ramps up the stakes because the Green Goblin is a massive threat in this movie, and knowing the secret identity of Spider-Man is something that the Green Goblin gleefully weaponizes. He takes full advantage of this, attacking every everyone that Peter Parker loves. Spider-Man is still idealistic, endlessly committed to doing the right thing, so the Green Goblin puts Spider-Man in a position where there is no good decision, there is no right thing, as he has both Mary Jane Watson, the girl of Peter Parker's dreams, and a cable car full of little children suspended upon the Brooklyn Bridge, and he's prepared to drop them both. The ultimate test of Spider-Man's ideology, and one which it surely cannot withstand. Surely there is no right decision here. Whoever Spider-Man saves, somebody else dies. Which makes the Green Goblin such a complex threat for this film, and he just, he works Peter Parker out at every turn. And if you think that is all good on a thematic level and a writing level and everything, can we also just pair that up with Willem Dafoe? the perfect casting for this role, the perfect performance for this role. Holy shit, it's like Christmas for Green Goblin fans. Yeah, but his costume looks like a Power Ranger. Yeah, and you look like a dumpy little piece of shit, fuck you. I don't care, I, I think this costume looks great, just get, get out of my face, thank you. So on one hand, we have some provocative imagery for comic book fans. We've got Spider-Man's girlfriend suspended above the Brooklyn Bridge by the Green Goblin. Oh fuck, are they going to do what we think we're going to do? We, uh, we probably shouldn't take a happy ending for granted right now. See? Upping the stakes. Upping the stakes for those in the know. It's rewarding to be a Spider-Man fan at this moment. But in this moment, Spider-Man kind of risks it all and goes out of his way to save them both, and it's a seemingly impossible task. Spider-Man is desperately clinging on to his chances of saving both Mary Jane and the cable car full of children. And it's especially not easy when the Green Goblin is constantly going after you. A militant enemy armed to the teeth. But Spider-Man is a New Yorker. And New Yorkers have each other's backs. As citizens on the bridge distract the Green Goblin by pelting trash at him, yelling at him in defense of Spider-Man, and then two other New Yorkers move a barge beneath the cable cart to catch it. This scene is not just Spider-Man versus the Green Goblin, this is New York versus the Green Goblin. And this is the point where Spider-Man 2002 cements itself as the most important superhero film ever made. So let's go on a quick tangent. Post 9-11 cinema. 
it tends to be quite a nihilistic thing where a lot of different cinematographers or filmmakers will just use kind of 9-11-esque imagery to evoke feelings of terror and horror in the audience. Apocalyptic events that carry that kind of imagery where it's not done for thrills and excitement, it's done to really rattle and shake the audience in a really bad way. Spider-Man 2002 was one of the earliest examples of post 9-11 cinema, but in this case it was utilized very differently. Shortly after 9-11, a lot of Americans, and a lot of New Yorkers in particular, were living in fear. It was a frightening and cynical time. So, given the time frame, having this scene here of regular everyday New Yorkers helping Spider-Man to take down a militant threat because they're all together, and they're all united, and they have each other's backs, that was a beautiful moment. For just a brief moment, that New York mentality, that attitude, that sass, was all back together as though 9-11 never even happened. I mean, okay, of course it did. I don't want to speak like flippantly on that or anything, but you, you get what I'm saying here. It was a moment of pure movie magic escapism, and it kind of brought the whole Spider-Man experience together as kind of the symbol of everything America can represent, all of that ideology, hope, truth, justice, the American way, and the tale of a young man growing up in this world. He's tested one last time when he's beaten to a bloody pulp by Norman Osborn. I kind of like that. I, I like the fact that when all is lost for the Green Goblin, he just resorts to beating the ever-loving shit out of Peter. And we see him once again try to manipulate Peter, reaching out as though he's the father figure that Peter Parker once lost, but we get that reiteration that Peter already had a father whose name was Uncle Ben. And in his last act of vengeance and cruelty, the Green Goblin's plan backfires and he gets a glider in the fucking balls. But that's not really a win for Peter Parker because Norman Osborn still meant something to him and that's also his best friend's dad. So it kind of ends on a bittersweet note there. And then there's one final test. Mary Jane confesses love for Peter Parker at Harry Osborn's father's funeral. That's a weird time to do that, but okay. And Peter Parker rejects her because it's no longer about what he wants. It's no longer about the girl next door. He's duty bound for bigger things. He's able to help people, so he should. There'll be enemies, there'll be dangers, and he doesn't want Mary Jane to be a part of that, even though she totally is. And our final shot is Peter Parker atop the Empire State Building, the American flag flying, swinging at us. An all-American end to an all-American piece of cinema. Ah, oh, it's just, it's fucking beautiful, man. Like, like the film or not, you can't deny that it definitely holds a very important place in the history of American cinema. And if you try to deny that, you just, you're gonna look like a fucking ten-year-old. I'm just gonna straight up say it. I'm just gonna be honest about it. You know, have whatever opinion you want about this film. But the fact is, it is one very important superhero film. But for me, this stuff is only even just scratching the surface of why this film is brilliant. I haven't even talked about the scenes at the Daily Bugle and the perfect casting of J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. This film just has so much to give and I highly recommend that you all go back and watch it again. Yes, maybe some of the dialogue pays just a little too much homage to the style of a classic comic book. Maybe it doesn't entirely feel natural to how people really speak in real life, but thematically, it all really holds up. And it's just, in my opinion, it's, just, it's an incredible film. Few films have played as substantial a role in my life as Spider-Man 2 has. It's hard to know where to begin when talking about a film that holds such a profound personal importance. I recall that Spider-Man 2 was the third film that I'd ever seen in the cinema, the first being Toy Story 2 and the second being Shrek 2. When Spider-Man 2 was coming out, I was pretty cautious about it. Yes, as an 8-year-old kid, I was cautious about an upcoming Spider-Man film. Some things never change, the reasons do though. See, as a kid, I wouldn't get to see Spider-Man 1 in the movie theater. It was a 12 here in the UK. I had to wait until the VHS release, and I remember pretty vividly that I was more excited by the toys that accompanied that release than the film itself. Why? Because as a six-year-old, I wasn't really interested in Peter Parker or his world. 
I just wanted to see Spider-Man performing stunts and beating up bad guys. The film did deliver on that front, but I was still at that age where a two-hour movie feels like an entire day. So given that you don't really see Spider-Man until a little before the halfway mark, it felt like a long time to wait to see Spider-Man in a movie called Spider-Man at that age. You guys know how I feel about that movie now. As a kid, I was mesmerized by the Spider-Man action, which remains exciting today as it was back then. But as an adult, what really separates the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films from other comic book movies is their investment in the character of Peter Parker and the willingness to explore the flaws and pitfalls that come with this man's double life. Spider-Man 1 is truly something special, even if my younger self couldn't quite recognize that. But then the question is, how did eight-year-old me feel about Spider-Man 2? Well, I recall running out of the cinema after the film had ended, making little imaginary web flips, declaring it the best movie ever, and begging my parents to take me to Burger King so I could get a kid's meal with a Spider-Man toy. The toy was this plastic web shooter with a paper tube that would extend with with webs printed on it, giving off the illusion of a web shooter. I played with this toy something fierce though, thought it was truly special because unlike those silly string web shooters that you could pay money for, this one would never run out. Kid me though, it, it's paper mate, calm down. But I think that this is just a testament to how much this film captured my imagination at this age. In terms of my opinion of this film, since I was eight years old and I first saw it, my opinion hasn't actually changed that much, but the reasons for it have. See, back then, the extent of my praise was basically, it has lots of Spider-Man in it, which is, I guess, not untrue. Yeah, this one is the Spider-Man No More movie, but there's no shortage of Spider-Man swinging about, falling down alleys, getting his ass beat up by Doc Ock, delivering pizzas, stealing that guy's pizza, stopping car robberies. The Spider-Man angle is just more present this time around, so naturally, Kid Me felt more sated as far as stunts and costumes go. But at this stage, I want to move on from 8-year-old me now. Let's move over to 26-year-old me, because a kid is rarely a great source for insightful commentary. I don't know, I'm, I'm really just here though to talk and gush generally. Hello there, I'm Captain America, and I'm here to give you a PSA. Now, if you love your country, you'll want to subscribe to Channel Pup. If you don't love your country, well, that's just too bad. But you can still subscribe anyway. Kami's welcome. And of course, well, actually, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, but of course, nothing comes free in this country except for freedom. And no exception is the Adobe subscriptions that Channel Pub needs to make these videos. So be sure to check out the patron link in the description below. And God bless America. A point you'll see flying around quite a bit on social media is that Spider-Man 2 is overrated. And much of the praise for this film is determined by the nostalgia of those who grew up watching it. Now, on one hand, yes, Spider-Man 2 is a reminder of one of the happiest periods of my life. But that's only because this movie inspired that happiness in the first place. So, like, I guess I can understand the angle of, like, yeah, this film does remind people of happy times, but generally, I couldn't disagree with this point more. I mean, I'm gonna jump in my own principles real quick, which I don't expect everyone to share, but this whole thing just reeks of the dismissal of positive points rather than providing even a basic thesis as to why Spider-Man 2 might not be that good. I'm not saying you're wrong to dislike Spider-Man 2, as tricky as it is to avoid that line of thinking, but to chalk all positivity up to nostalgia is just such a nothing and unproductive point. Also, I do tend to avoid words like overrated because it feels like it's just kind of acting as though my opinion of a film matters more than the people that like it more than I do. It's overrated, says who? Is the person that thinks I'm overrating this film an objective measure for its actual quality? But with all that being said, what is so damn special about Spider-Man 2? What makes it stand above other superhero films in the eyes of its fans? Well, I don't think I've ever seen a superhero movie dive into the humanity of its protagonist and with such intricate world building as Spider-Man 2. I mean, look, take a film like Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, a film that is very disinterested in its characters and possible themes in favor of, woo, spectacle and sci-fi. Spider-Man 2 is the absolute antithesis to that. But how? 
Well, Spider-Man 1 established with its ending that Peter's vow to Spider-Man, his vow to responsibility, means that he needs to maintain some distance between himself and those he loves. Consequently, Spider-Man 2 explores the toll that this takes on Peter, as his life as Spider-Man becomes destructive to his life as Peter Parker. We've established that there needs to be some distance between Peter and MJ. We are now exploring how difficult this is for Peter, even more difficult with Mary Jane becoming engaged to John Jameson. Tension is growing between Peter and his best friend Harry Osborn over the death of Harry's father, Norman. Peter finally reveals the truth about his role in the death of Uncle Ben to Aunt May, but cannot reveal to her what he'd go on to do and how he would take responsibility for it, creating tensions between the two. He can't pay his rent, he can't hold down a job, and what's so great about all of this is that nothing is glossed over. We actually spend a little time with Peter and his landlord, Mr. Ditkovich. We learn who he is and what he's about, who his family are. Yes, it is easy to dismiss him as a comic relief side character, but he's here for a reason. The first scene of this movie has Spider-Man delivering pizzas while also saving some jaywalking kids, only to arrive at the customers mere minutes late and be fired because of it and Joe's Pizza's dumb delivery time guarantee refund policy in this universe. Which is obviously gonna put the staff on the firing line. Don't make promises you can't keep, Mr. Aziz, because they're not gonna be the best kind for another eight years yet. The point I'm making is we don't just hear of Peter getting fired. We don't just hear of him being late on the rent. We see it, we experience it and it brings us more quotable characters like Mr. Aziz and Mr. Ditkovich. So I mentioned before, Mary Jane is engaged to John Jameson, which all could have happened off screen, but that's just not how Spider-Man 2 approaches its world building. John Jameson's screen time probably amounts to around about a minute, but in that very brief time, they managed to build an interesting parallel between Spider-Man and John Jameson. John Jameson is the astronaut son of J. Jonah Jameson. He's kind of viewed and treated as the all-American hero, but unlike Spider-Man, there's no double life going on, meaning that he can become engaged to Mary Jane. He can have a personal life. He gets the recognition that comes with being a hero, and of course, there's this juxtaposition between J. Jonah Jameson's attitude towards Spider-Man, pushing him as this menace to the city, and then his son, John Jameson, who he brags about constantly. Peter is an American hero in his own right, but when he becomes absent in the lives of others, nobody can understand why. When it comes to Harry Osborn, he believes that Spider-Man murdered his father, Norman, and Peter is honoring Norman's wishes that he not tell Harry that he was the Green Goblin. This really speaks to the strength of Peter's character. The Green Goblin was his enemy, he tormented him, and yet Peter is keeping all of that a secret to protect his loved ones. So while Peter, someone who has done all he can to be a friend to Harry, aside from smooching his girlfriend in the first movie, is taking the brunt of Harry's grief and apathy over the death of his father Norman, who was generally not a good father to Harry. It's intensified by the fact that Harry is aware of Peter's affiliations with Spider-Man, given that he takes his picture for the Daily Bugle. Peter is protecting the image of Norman Osborn all at the expense of his own life. Spider-Man 2 does an incredible job of taking a regular mundane life where Peter holds down a basic job, has a relationship, and his friends all like him, and turns it into a fantasy for this character. While swinging above tall buildings and fighting villains is the crushing reality that he has to live with. It's a total inverse of what you'd typically expect life as a superhero to feel like. Being Spider-Man is not escapism for Peter. Walking down the street and eating a hot dog is. What's more is that Peter's spider powers are now starting to fade as well. You'd sincerely wonder what's the point of being Spider-Man at this stage. Well, aside from keeping eight-year-old me's attention, I guess. Now, there's a lot of clever stuff here, even if we just completely boil it down to the comic nerdy stuff. In these films, Spider-Man's webs are fully organic. They just shoot straight out of his wrists. So you're not necessarily going to see him in the midst of a high-stakes action sequence running out of webs, right? Well, nope, that's not the case. We've got a way around it. 
we've got a story here where Peter's powers are starting to fade with his motivation to continue on as Spider-Man. It's his mind's influence over his powers, and his powers way of telling him it's time to stop. And so he does after a meeting with a psychologist where he chalks up his tenure as Spider-Man to just dreams to avoid revealing his secret identity. I think the psychologist knows though. Once again, we don't just hear of Peter making the decision to let Spider-Man go. We have a dream sequence of him rejecting Uncle Ben's wishes, which any normal person would still think he took a little too literally, but hey, I'm not Uncle Ben, what do I know? And so the die is cast. Spider-Man is no more. The life of Peter Parker resumes as it were, but things aren't quite as they seem. Even though Peter is more present in the lives of his loved ones, there is such a thing as too late. Peter's attempts at restoking the flame between him and MJ are rendered null and void. The damage done to his life is done. After revealing the truth about Uncle Ben's death to Aunt May, Peter is now at his absolute lowest point, questioning if he's ever meant to have anything he wants. Now, remember I mentioned earlier that Mr. Dikovich's family, they actually play a role in this film? Dikovich's daughter Ursula breaks the downward spiral, offering Peter Parker something so simple as a slice of chocolate cakey relief. And from here, things do start to sort themselves out. Aunt May comes to terms with what happened with Uncle Ben and inspires Peter to get up one last time in the same way that Uncle Ben did, all while being pretty ambiguous as to whether or not she knows that he was Spider-Man. And MJ starts to reconsider her feelings towards Peter. Heck, even J. Jonah Jameson starts to reconsider his stance on Spider-Man, but what forces him back into the red and blue is Doc Ock. Wow. It is insane that I've gotten to 12 minutes and 25 seconds into this video without even mentioning Doc Ock. So Peter starts pursuing the work of Otto Octavius in a bid to improve his grades, and Dr. Connors arranges an appointment with Octavius for Peter to get to know him. Octavius is pursuing his dream of free renewable energy by creating a miniature artificial sun that he operates with a set of mechanical arms operated by his brain, which is protected by an inhibitor chip. The experiment goes south, Octavius is humiliated, his wife killed in the disaster, and the inhibitor chip is destroyed, giving Ox tentacles complete control over his mind. Octavius is now hell-bent on retrying the experiment at any cost, holding anything and anyone to ransom as collateral, including Mary Jane. With his life both as Spider-Man and Peter Parker now hanging in the balance, Spider-Man returns to defeat Doc Ock and put a stop to his artificial sun experiment. Both Spider-Man and Doc Ock are dreamers. Peter yearns for a happy life, a hilltop wedding with Mary Jane Watson. Otto is a man crushed by the weight of his ambition. He originally set out to create his artificial son to benefit mankind. Now he's willing to recreate that experiment, and the fate of the entire city is an acceptable sacrifice. He is now controlled by his own invention being his mechanical arms. In the end, Doc Ock finally accepts that he's become crushed by the weight of his dreams and takes responsibility. He takes his last moment of clarity as a chance to not die a monster and brings the artificial sun into the river with him where he drowns. Peter's identity is revealed to Mary Jane, the barrier between the two is finally broken. Mary Jane finally understands the distance the two of them had. All is forgiven but Peter still chooses responsibility. He sends Mary Jane back into the loving arms of fiance John Jameson. But on the day of her wedding, Mary Jane chooses Peter. She abandons John Jameson at the altar and runs to Peter instead, making her own choice to be with him. And Spider-Man swings off into the sunset as Mary Jane watches on with a look of concern and dread on her face, which closes out the film. At its core, the theme of Spider-Man 2 is dreams, and the choices that we make according to them. Peter dreams of being with Mary Jane Watson, but continually denies himself that dream in the name of acting responsibly, keeping her out of danger, honoring the wishes of Uncle Ben. A lot of this is communicated through dreamlike imagery and language. Peter tells Mary Jane he envisioned her getting married on a hilltop. Peter finally rejects Uncle Ben's wishes in a dream sequence. Octavius dreams of creating a completely sustainable energy source. 
using his scientific gift to benefit mankind. When his dream is initially denied, he stops at nothing to realize it, no matter the cost. When it comes to Peter, his life is destructive to his dreams. But when it comes to Otto, his dreams are destructive to his life, making the two of them like a yin and yang. It's also helped by the fact that a spider has eight legs and an octopus has eight tentacles. We've also got Harry Osborn who dreams of living up to his father's legacy. He funds Otto Octavius' failed experiment. He hallucinates his father demanding he be avenged, which ultimately leads him into the lair of the Green Goblin, revealing the truth about his father. Up until this point, Harry has spent his time deluded into thinking that Norman Osborn was innocent. And the reveal of the Green Goblin lair is like an awakening. Aunt May holds an integral role in this film. It's her who delivers the line that defines this film, the themes, and Peter's arc in the same way that Uncle Ben did in Spider-Man 1. An evolution of the with great power comes great responsibility mantra, and one that is in every way as profound and haunting as the with great power comes great responsibility mantra. Sometimes, to do what's right, we have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most, even our dreams. A haunting line of dialogue that defines this story. Little bit of trivia here, the word dream or dreams comes up 15 times in the script for Spider-Man 2. While Spider-Man 1 was by no means thematically bankrupt, in fact, I still consider it to be one of the most important movies of all time, Spider-Man 2 has quite a bit more on its mind. It's suitably more mature than its predecessor. The goofy, hokey, comic booky dialogue is for the most part absent this time around. Spider-Man 2 is a sadder, more mature film with a much broader sense of scope. The cinematography this time around is much cleaner, with less production goofs such as cameras and tripods in shot like Spider-Man 1 had. It's also a little less colourful this time around, but there's a lot more confidence in the camera angles and movements. Sadly, all copies of the film available for home release are in a tightly letterboxed aspect ratio, which in my opinion feels a bit too tight and claustrophobic considering the vast personal scope of this film and how it explores this landscape of lives in New York City. It doesn't feel like it was filmed for Letterbox. There are a lot of close-up shots of faces and expressions, and it feels like we're only getting a slither of that in our Letterboxd aspect ratio compared to what I feel we should have gotten. This is a quote that will be taken out of context for years to come, but... It just feels too tight. My preferred way to watch this one is using the 35mm open mat. You get the whole image and it looks gorgeous. Plus, unlike the Spider-Man 1 35mm open mat, everything here is designed to fit within the 4-3 aspect ratio. I much prefer to get the whole image rather than just the fraction of it we get in the home releases. If Sony announce a home release of the 4x3 35mm open mat version of this film, believe me, I would buy it day one. Sam Raimi's directing has also stepped up a notch too. Action sequences are kept continuously fresh by Raimi enveloping the codes and conventions of other various genres into his action sequences as they rapidly move from high stakes tension to slapstick to drama to horror. We'll cut from shots of Spider-Man and Doc Ock in action to shots of the crowd and civilians who are all doing something, as opposed to just standing there reacting. Every background extra feels like a character in their own tiny vignette, and they never feel passive. Spider-Man 2 is also home to some of the most rhythmic and exhilarating action sequences I've ever seen in any movie, as the action makes use of every possible element of the environment and characters. But to stop these from feeling like purely elaborate dances, we also get plenty of moments with Spider-Man and Ock just throwing punches at each other, beating each other into submission, which is the difference between pure spectacle and character drama. Also, the scene with Doc Ock in the hospital having his tentacles removed? An incredible piece of horror film directing, and it's no surprise that this comes from horror veteran Sam Raimi, whose signature is just all over this film. Danny Elfman has also stepped up on the soundtrack. It's much more of an emotional score this time, befitting of a more mature and emotional film. The use of leitmotifs by Spider-Man and Octavius 
It's as strong as it was in the first Spider-Man film score. But there are also some excellent callbacks, particularly in the fire scene, which uses the same musical cues as the fire from the first film. Now, writing-wise, there's a few other things that I do want to talk about with this movie, particularly the characters of Peter and Mary Jane. A common criticism of Spider-Man 2 is that Mary Jane becomes incredibly unlikable over the course of the film. This is not helped by the fact that there are some things that she did in Spider-Man 1 which, when you think about, are pretty unlikable. The unlikable reputation of Mary Jane Watson is something I do want to explore, because in some ways I do agree, in others not so much. For one, I think it's deliberate that Mary Jane is an incredibly flawed character between Spider-Man 1 and 2. In Spider-Man 1, yes, she cheats on Harry Osborn with Spider-Man while the two were officially dating. Now I will say this, while they were officially dating, labels on it, I don't believe that Mary Jane and Harry were at all serious. There was never an on-screen kiss, the two did not have any chemistry whatsoever, and the two characters are portrayed as very young. Moving into Spider-Man 2, Mary Jane was accused of using John Jameson as leverage against Peter, but I don't think that is really true. I think more than anything else, she wanted to move on and tried to force herself to by getting engaged to John Jameson. Where my sympathy for Mary Jane starts to dwindle, though, is when she tries to kiss Peter at the cafe while in a relationship with John. Scratch that while engaged to John, it's even up a notch. With that being said, I think her intentions would have been entirely to break up with John had Peter reciprocated, which wouldn't be as bad as outright staying with him after kissing another man. But where my sympathy kind of just runs out and I feel she goes too far is abandoning him at the altar. If you've ever known someone who has been abandoned at the altar, you'll probably be aware that it's a pretty traumatizing experience and a horrible thing to inflict on anyone. It's not helped by the fact that John Jameson is a perfectly likable guy. At the same time, it is easy to kind of say that she should have broken things off earlier when she realized that she still had feelings for Peter after the cafe sequence, but in fairness, she got kidnapped and then the very next day, presumably, she's getting married. She didn't actually have a lot of chances to put the kibosh on things, and finding out that Peter was Spider-Man would have been something of a game changer. What was she actually supposed to do here? Well, I mean... She could marry him and then get a divorce later, but then that's a whole can of worms. Sometimes you gotta do these things as soon as you can. Best thing, call him in the morning and call off the wedding. I mean, that's also gonna hurt him, but like, surely it's not as bad as getting left at the altar, because then you don't have to deal with the outright humiliation. I don't know, it was a very complex case. Now, with all that being said, it is worth exploring the flaws of Peter Parker as well. See, in Spider-Man 1, he had a little crush, viewing MJ as the girl next door, and the two did have a clear connection. In Spider-Man 2, Peter's view of Mary Jane Watson is actually pretty unhealthy. She is his dream, and he treats her as such, asserting to her how he imagined her getting married on a hilltop, expecting her to drop everything to be with him when he gives up being Spider-Man. Peter is in love with the idea of a life with Mary Jane. He's in love with his dream first and foremost. At the end of the film, Peter gets what he wants. His dream comes true. Mary Jane stands at his doorway and confesses her love. But as the relationship is consummated by a kiss, Peter swings off into the sunset. And there's a look of dread on Mary Jane's face. Because there's a distinct difference between dream and reality. I don't think this whole thing is executed perfectly. Again, Mary Jane was a flawed character before, with indecision being her ultimate weakness, but abandoning a dude at the altar was just outright cold, whatever the reason. I think this is what cemented her as a straight-up irredeemable character in the eyes of a lot of people. But I do think we do need to acknowledge that while I don't think total unlikability was the intention, I don't think they wanted us to see this as exactly a good thing either. We're happy for Peter in this moment, but I think there is a reason why the final shot of the film is Mary Jane filled with dread. And I think for as much as we acknowledge the flaws of Mary Jane Watson as a character, 
it's a little unhealthy how we barely talk about how Peter kind of objectifies Mary Jane. And I think what I like about this film is that it doesn't vilify any of that either. And I think this is where this film showcases such an excellent understanding of the humanity that comes with these characters and their actions. It's why even though Peter Parker's dream is a very flawed one, you still want to root for him and you still feel happy when he gets what he wants. There's still a sense of emotional catharsis even though we know that him and Mary Jane are not mature enough for each other. Now I do quickly want to talk about the extended cut of this film, Spider-Man 2.1. In the lead up to Spider-Man 3, Sony wanted to re-release Spider-Man 2 with some additional footage, asking Sam Raimi if he wanted to release a director's cut. Sam Raimi was fine with the idea of releasing an alternative cut, but didn't want to call it a director's cut, as he felt the cinematic release was everything he wanted it to be. He still considers the theatrical version to be the definitive version of the film, and I have to say, I completely agree with Raimi. And so Spider-Man 2.1 was born. Spider-Man 2.1 is an excellent film, in the same way that Spider-Man 2 is an excellent film. It is, by and large, the same movie. Everything I love about this film is still here, aside from Mr. Aziz's delivery of the GOOOOOO! Let's say the theatrical cut of Spider-Man 2 never released and this released in its place. Well, I think the film would still be as popular today as it was then. So we've got some extended scenes such as Peter's birthday, some additional shots in two of the Doc Ock fights, an extended elevator conversation, and a conversation between Mary Jane and a friend as she talks about her indecision when it comes to John Jameson. There's an extra eight minutes here, and unfortunately none of it really adds anything, aside from making the film just a bit longer. And I don't even mean that in a bad way, this is such a nothing extension. I feel like scenes like the conversation between MJ and her friend are kind of good as it gives us a bit more insight as to her character and where she's at, but the elevator scene goes on far too long now, and the performance of the elevator guy has lost all of its subtlety falling into feeling a bit more like a parody. The original elevator scene works so well because of the awkward pauses between the interactions. The 2.1 version on the other hand is just non-stop quick-fire marketing jokes. Then there are the additional shots in the Doc Ock action sequences. We've got a bit more of Spider-Man punching Doc Ock in the face during the bank fight, which doesn't really add anything but more questions to ask about why Doc Ock's face doesn't look like a meatball after those punches. And then we've got the shot where Spider-Man actually gets hit by a train during the train fight and immediately gets back up, alleviating any stakes as far as Spider-Man's mortality is concerned. To me, the theatrical cut is definitely the stronger version of the film. Spider-Man 2. It's a film that fires off on all cylinders with his action set pieces and delivers all of the spectacle you would hope for from a Spider-Man movie and then some. But what separates it from other superhero films is the heightened interest in the humanity of its characters and the theme of dreams. Spider-Man 2 is mature, surreal, sad, silly, triumphant, fun, exhilarating, perfectly paced, tenacious, confident, and such a downright masterpiece that the reasons it resonates with fans in the way that it does after two decades are pretty damn obvious just looking at this film as a body of work. Everything is done to such a high quality, such a high standard. Sam Raimi's directing is as good as it gets. The writing is as good as it gets. The performances are as good as you could get. The action, the choreography, the cinematography, the music are all as good as you could possibly ask for. So no, it's not nostalgia. You don't need to grow up with Spider-Man 2 to see just how much great quality stuff there is in this film. You just need to engage with it. It. I'm not saying that you have to like Spider-Man 2, but it is a film that absolutely commands respect. Now before we go, I just, I want to treat you guys to a special surprise. So thanks to the help, support, and friendship of Suris from Suris the Skeptic and Nick from Game Apologist, I was able to go on a road trip of the East Coast USA. And one of the stops along the way was New York City. It's been my dream to go to New York City since I first saw Spider-Man 2, all those years ago. And while this trip was nothing more than a stop on a longer road trip, it was a dream come true. I recall walking around as the Flatiron Building just sneaks up on you. 
The flat iron building was, of course, the exterior of the Daily Bugle in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. This would be where J. Jonah Jameson would fire and unfire Peter Parker repeatedly after his crap photos. Turn around and you are snuck up upon by the Empire State Building. This absolute Goliath would be the building Spider-Man would swing off of in the very last shot of Spider-Man 1, and often serves as an attraction for Spider-Man fans to climb up in the Spider-Man video games. This building is so high that the searchlights atop it cast a shadow of the building into the clouds. We also saw the Chrysler Building. It was here where the human spider reflected upon the death of Uncle Ben. Close by to that is Grand and Central Station, where Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man would throw down with the Scorpion in the Spider-Man 1 video game. We saw the Statue of Liberty from a distance, a very, very vast distance, where Spider-Man would throw down with Mysterio in Spider-Man 2 the game, but also where Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man would unite with Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland's Spider-Man to cure their oldest foes. And finally, one of the most important stops on this journey, Joe's Pizza on Carmine Street. Now, in the film, if the sticker on Tobey Maguire's helmet is anything to go by, Joe's Pizza is on Bleecker Street, but the real deal is on Carmine Street. And in this pizza restaurant, they clearly celebrate their legacy as part of Spider-Man history. From images of Tobey Maguire up on the walls, and a sign saying that this place was seen in Spider-Man. Two, to be precise. The company logo is identical to the one seen in the film, and the owner of the place was even so kind as to take a selfie with us outside the building. I think he knew why we were there, but of course I did get a slice of pizza too, and I can safely say that, yeah, that nasty lady at the reception desk definitely should have paid for this. It is damn good. We also made sure to take home a couple of pizza boxes as well, because these things are basically props from the film. I am also pleased to report that they do appear to treat their staff a lot better than they did in Spider-Man 2 the movie. They must be some really good sports there. This was, like, akin to, like, a pilgrimage for me. I think every Spider-Man fan at some stage deserves to take a trip to New York, and especially a trip to Joe's Pizza. Because as someone who's grown up with Spider-Man being such an integral part of my life, actually getting to see his city, see all of these landmarks that we've seen in these movies, safe to say it was a very spiritual experience. Spider-Man 3 doesn't have a great reputation, certainly not as great as both of its predecessors. While it has in recent years received a little more love from its own cult following, such is life with these controversial blockbusters as you'll see later, the general sentiment towards Spider-Man 3 is that it's a disappointing follow-up to both Spider-Man 1 and 2. I mean, okay, anecdote for you, this would have been only a couple of years ago, but I remember in my first year at university, a buddy of mine would go out onto the campus square with a different sign inviting people to debate him on a global subject, the goal being that both parties would learn something from each other's perspective. And there was this small community of folks who decided to push back against this guy by hosting their own debating table where they'd put bait topics onto their signs, one of which being Spider-Man 3 is a classic. Now, these guys thought they were being very clever and very ironic, but I have to say I do agree with their sign. And yes, again, it's just bait, and to that I say, BORING OPINION! NO BED COVERS FOR YOU TONIGHT! Also, I know that Mr. Debate Bro watches my videos from time to time, so if you're watching, Hi Max, hope you're doing well. Like Max, I think Spider-Man 3 is a little misunderstood. There was a time when I would have agreed with the overall sentiment that Spider-Man 3 was a bit poopy. But I think, looking at the state of superhero films today, and setting aside the hype revolving around the fan-favorite characters that Spider-Man 3 would include back in 2007, revisiting Spider-Man 3, it's much easier to identify the strengths of this movie, even down to just stuff that we took for granted at the time. I think much of Spider-Man 3's cult following that have grown to love this movie will have been kids at the time the film released, and today revisit it as adults, therefore getting more out of it. See, it's strange to me that the Spider-Man movies were always marketed towards families as this superhero spectacle. Marketing would often revolve around, who is Spider-Man up against this time? Who will you be buying action figures of at Toys R Us? And the marketing of Spider-Man 3 was led by the black suit, which could only mean one thing, fan-favorite villain Venom would be in Spider-Man 3, 
as was teased in incredibly small fleeting shots by only a handful of the film's marketing. This film would not only feature Venom and the Black Suit, but we'd also see Harry Osborn finally become the Green Goblin after three films of build-up, and Sandman was going to be there too. This film sounded like it was going to be a dream come true for the kiddies who loved Spider-Man and his numerous cartoons and comics. But we're about to learn a few things about dreams in this video. Tell me, did you subscribe? You will. And you'd better not forget to hit that like button as well. This video is not sponsored by Wayne Enterprises or LexCorp. So check out the patron link in the description below and consider making a monthly pledge. Men are still good. See, with Spider-Man 2, yes, Spider-Man and Doc Ock were brawling on all of the cereal boxes, but the film at its core was really about the dreams of Peter Parker wanting to be with Mary Jane Watson, while his duties as Spider-Man stood in the way of said dreams. Spider-Man 3, like Spider-Man 2, is mature, emotionally grounded. While the action and stakes are larger than life as usual, they are still just one layer of a film that is ultimately about very flawed people and their very flawed flaws. Don't record another tape, we're gonna leave that. Picking up where Spider-Man 2 left off, Peter Parker and Mary Jane are now together, and Peter wants to marry Mary Jane. Not only that, Spider-Man has the approval of New York City in spite of J. Jonah Jameson's libelous claims, and he's the top of his class. You literally start this film off with a happy ending. In Spider-Man 2, Peter was continually denied his dreams, when he wasn't denying them himself in the name of responsibility. In Spider-Man 3, Peter's living the dream. Everything worked out. But there is an observation when it comes to Peter Parker's characterization in Spider-Man 3. Peter Parker comes across as incredibly oblivious and at times unempathetic. Mary Jane is fired from her acting gig, and all Peter can do is talk about how tough it was being Spider-Man and how good it is now. In a public ceremony where Spider-Man is given the key to the city by Gwen Stacy, Spider-Man and Gwen share a smooch on stage, reminiscent to the kiss shared between Spider-Man and Mary Jane in the first film. This is essentially akin to when actors kiss. It was all performative and for PR. However, one can't blame MJ for not feeling good about this, especially when Gwen rocks up to Peter and MJ's date at the French restaurant with her hands all over him, how they're lab partners. Regardless of the purpose of the kiss, that kiss used to belong to Peter and MJ, and the act is still happening, regardless of any emotion or lack thereof behind it. Now, there is a parallel that I feel they could have brought up here. Mary Jane is an actor for the theater. Actors in theater and film often have to kiss other actors as part of the performance. This could have possibly been touched upon, maybe explore the performative similarities between Spider-Man and Mary Jane's acting career. Now, a lot of people do clown on the character drama here, and I suppose it's an easy target. Mary Jane is upset that Peter kissed Gwen Stacy in the same way he kissed her in Spider-Man 1, when that kiss was an act of adultery from Mary Jane in the first place. People often joke about the line where Mary Jane tells Peter, This isn't about you, it's about me. Yeah, we get it, the film is called Spider-Man, it's a joke as old as time, but... Spider-Man 3 is a pretty emotionally mature film, so I want to approach it from a more mature perspective than that. Right now, Mary Jane isn't really doing anything wrong here. Her previous fatal flaw was her indecisiveness, which was acknowledged in Spider-Man 2 when Peter joked that Mary Jane hadn't picked a groom in his hypothetical hilltop wedding. But she's genuinely committed to Peter here, and her concerns are valid. I do quite like the fact that we're exploring that, as a regular human being with no superpowers, in a relationship, Mary Jane can't quite relate to Spider-Man. Her acting career and Spider-Man, while there's definitely parallels which aren't really addressed, there's still a great disparity between acting on stage and actually having superpowers living a double life. Now let's get back to Peter's characterization here for a second. Yes, he's oblivious. Why would you propose to Mary Jane after kissing Gwen Stacy on stage and not even talking about it? He's incredibly oblivious to her suffering and insecurities. 
This isn't necessarily a regression of Peter Parker's character though. This is naturally what would happen. I said before in Spider-Man 2 that Peter's view of Mary Jane was unhealthy. Now his dream has come true and he's living it as though it's a dream. He's daydreaming through life. He's got his happy ending. He's now complacent. I think the feeling here is frustration. As an audience member, you are frustrated by Peter Parker. He finally got what he wanted in Spider-Man 2 and now he's squandering it. But it's also understandable to some extent. Being Spider-Man put Peter's life on hold during some pivotal times in his life, and for that he's got some more maturing to do. He's a little bit left behind. He wants to marry Mary Jane when he's barely got a grip on this relationship thing, and he's not doing very well. When Peter reveals to Aunt May that he plans on proposing to Mary Jane, Aunt May tells him that a man must put his wife before himself, as Uncle Ben did, and gives him the ring Uncle Ben gave her. And Peter goes on to do this all wrong. He's with Mary Jane for his own self-interests. And all while he's in that relationship, he's acting on his own self-interests. But okay, surely they can work it out, right? Well, there's this little thing he has in his life called being Spider-Man, here to get in the way of all of that. Shortly after seeing Aunt May, Peter is attacked by a masked figure on a glider, revealed to be Harry Osborn, the new goblin. Now, something that doesn't really get explored sufficiently is the effect of the goblin serum on Harry. It doesn't turn him into this cackling maniac like it did with Norman, but he's fully aware that Norman was the green goblin at this stage, yet still seeks to avenge him. Surely if you believe that Spider-Man killed Norman, he must have done it in the heat of battle or for a good reason. With that said, emotions and grief are a very complex thing, and Harry is living in this sort of delusion that his father treasured him the way a father should. Maybe the serum accentuated that? Maybe I just mind my own damn business, poor guy's been through enough. Now back when I was a kid, I was pretty damn disappointed that New Goblin didn't look like a goblin. I was kind of hoping for an evolution of the Green Goblin from 2002, but Harry is a very different character from his father, and accordingly, he gets a different Goblin persona and costume. One more befitting of who he is. One that's a lot more subtle. It doesn't look like anything out of the comic books, but it's a unique design and one that feels like it's made for Harry. I'm not entirely sure as to why the top of his head is exposed though, and yeah, probably shouldn't have been as that ends up being a plot point. Head trauma, after his first bout with Peter, causes him to lose his memory. Now, on one hand, this is kind of a very convenient benching of the character of Harry. Gets him out of Peter's hair for a bit, and that's something that is criticized as well. Amnesia storyline, go! But it also showcases that Harry could have lived a happy life if he finally let go of his obsession. He spent so much of the previous film and this film's first act brooding over his obsession that an audience member may have forgotten why him and Peter were such good friends in the first place. Giving Harry an accidental happy ending temporarily gives us some much needed recontextualization of him and Peter's actual friendship. With that being said, there's no shortage of vengeance going on here. Enter Sandman. See what I did there, Metallica fans? You like that? So Peter and Aunt May are brought into a meeting with Captain George Stacy of the NYPD. Captain Stacy informs the two that Uncle Ben's killer isn't who they thought, and that the real killer, Flint Marco, is still at large. So Flint Marco is an escaped convict and thief. He pursued a life of crime to pay for his sick daughter Penny's medical treatments, and he is the killer of Uncle Ben. While on the run from the cops, he finds himself stumbling into a sand collider. The sand scientists don't bother with the checks and balances, activate the machine, and Flint Marco becomes the Sandman, a man made of sand. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. We've got a return to Spider-Man's origins, a family man turned criminal, sand machines, and a lot of logical lapses. But you know what? I'll allow it. Now part of me would appreciate if a little more time were allowed to show Marco's desperation. That maybe he tried honest avenues to get his daughter's treatment, such as working more, pursuing whatever government welfare schemes he may be entitled to. But at the same time, it's not so much a plot hole or a mistake so much as, well, it's pretty much common sense that he would have done that at some stage, right? We just happen to be jumping into his story at this point. 
But I do think that there is a case to be made that this could be a bit more compelling if we'd seen that stuff play out. Or at least seen it a bit more acknowledged rather than just Marco saying, I'm not a bad person, I just had bad luck. It's not perfect, but it suffices. So Spider-Man has a new obsession. He's on the hunt to take down Flint Marco. This is the first time we've really seen Peter get truly distracted from his goal of being with Mary Jane. So you know he ain't kidding. He's listening in on police radios, making him far more absent from Mary Jane. While the newly reformed Harry, free from his vengeful obsessions, is able to be there for Mary Jane when Peter isn't. Oh boy, where's this going? A respectable role reversal though between these two characters, and like how Harry was imbued by the Goblin Serum, Peter gets his own little power up. You see, an asteroid fell from space in Central Park where Peter happened to be on a date with Mary Jane and attached itself to Peter's scooter following him home. This is all starting to sound a little bit random, isn't it? So there's this new guy at the Daily Bugle called Eddie Brock. Alright, okay, another element introduced. He's gunning for the staff job that Peter has worked years as a freelancer to earn. Eddie is everything that Peter isn't. He's cocky. He's cocky, overconfident, and will take whatever he can get whenever he can get it. This man has minimal restraint. Now, let's just put him in our back pocket for now and move on. Peter's emotions are already shot, and it's here where he discovers the black suit, a suit that enhances his power and his aggression. Peter takes comfort in this thing. It becomes like an addiction as it saps away at his principles, his inhibitions, but also his relationships. It's drugs. The black suit is a drug allegory. With his newly enhanced powers and rage, Spider-Man hunts down the Sandman and fights him to the finish, believing himself to have killed him. Peter is a new man, not taking any nonsense from anybody, not even Mr. Ditkovich who he hollers at. Now, gotta be said, it's great character development that Mr. Dikovich assumes the best in Peter rather than getting pissed. Once again, these movies, they absolutely do right by their side characters. Now, there is this incredible scene of Peter telling Aunt May how Spider-Man killed Uncle Ben's killer, and Aunt May does not approve in the slightest. This scene is so tense and shows how far removed Peter is from the man Uncle Ben and Aunt May raised, but also Peter expecting a positive reaction from Aunt May. It shows just how much he's lost touch with the people that he loves. But also, just the very claustrophobic way this scene is shot, the close-ups are incredibly tight. The contrast is really high, as Peter is kind of shrouded in darkness, even though there's a window with light emitting from it. Also, can I just take another opportunity to say how much I adore Rosemary Harris as Aunt May. She's one of the most important characters in this film series. She is absolutely incredible, easily my favourite interpretation of this character, and she doesn't get talked about enough. Yet she's a really powerful driving force in these movies. Both the writing and Rosemary Harris's performance, just I cannot praise them enough. Now, Peter becomes more absent and broody, and as that happens, Mary Jane is drawn more to Harry, until, uh oh, she cheats on Peter. Oopsie doopsie, well, that was inevitable, wasn't it? That girl that just can't keep her lips to herself for five minutes cheats on the main protagonist. Well, who'd have thunk it? But in all fairness, like, I do kind of get it, even if I don't condone it. Peter's being an ass and she's feeling trapped. It happens, now's not exactly the time for me to get on a moral soapbox. Shortly after this, Harry finally recovers from his amnesia and is egged on by some more of another vision of Norman Osborn. This causes Harry to resume the gob life as he threatens Mary Jane into breaking up with Peter. Very villainous, previously we had the Green Goblin who had threatened to kill all of Peter's loved ones, whereas this goblin just wants to date them. So MJ calls Peter to meet in Central Park where she breaks up with him. Peter then solves this by attempting to propose to her as he's being broken up with? Sheesh! Peter, you are too far gone, mate. There's oblivious, and then there's proposing to your ex-girlfriend as she is breaking up with you. I 
I don't know what to tell you, Peter. You're lost, boy. You're drunk. So Harry and Peter go out to lunch where Harry reveals that Mary Jane is dating him now. And Peter is so done with it all. You got this incredibly well-directed scene where Peter is just sat on his bed stewing. This is not the same man anymore. Peter Parker is barely recognizable as he glares off into the distance, the camera moving around him as his rage stirs and the iconic black suit theme plays. He sets out to beat the living daylights out of Harry Osborn in his home. This chaotic battle moves all through the mansion, and it's revealed that not only is Peter wearing the black suit under his clothing, Harry is also wearing at least part of his goblin suit under his, as his forearm blades poke out of his shirt. This fight moves all from the mansion to the goblin lair as the sky stick goes haywire. The danger is tangible, but these two don't even care. They're both out for blood. All of the tensions between these two now boiled over an unrestrained Peter against an obsessed Harry. And I just have to quickly mention that the score here by Christopher Young, there's this sense of ego to it as these two delusional personalities finally clash. The big band jazz feel is also long overdue for a Spider-Man movie. You know, a film set in New York City. That's no diss at the previous soundtracks though, it's just surprising that it took this long to land on this genre for a film set in New York City. Harry loses the fight, and at this point, Peter tells Harry everything he's probably wanted to for years. That his father never loved him. That he's done trying to convince him. Not that you really started, but hey ho. One last ditch effort, Harry launches a pumpkin bomb at Peter, and Peter just webs it right back at him, transforming Harry Osborn into Two-Face. Unofficially. Sorry, is, is this bullying? Is this a form of like body shaming or something? And now at this point, Peter's basically forcing his life into order, but he does take a bit of a fat W when he exposes Eddie Brock as a fraud who was manipulating existing photos to hand into Jameson. And it's here where we get an infamous scene. Peter finally reveling in his new life and identity. This is the scene that shows us how far Peter has fallen now that his inhibitions are completely dead in the water. The montage set to drive that funky soul, which is completely, unironically, an absolute jam of a song by the way. Peter struts down the street, making moves at random women, boogieing down in a new suit, flirting with Ursula Dickovich, asking her to make him cookies, ignoring Dr. Connor's warnings about the symbiote, flirting with Betty Brunt, and it's all just painful to watch, especially if you were invested in this character. In this scene here, Peter is impossible to root for, he's utterly unlikable. And that is perfect. Peter Parker is not a cool guy, he's awkward to a fault, and here he is with enhanced confidence, no inhibitions, completely whapped out on his addiction to a black substance. This is a guy who has fallen and fallen hard, and you know what I respect so much about this? Sam Raimi went all in on the symbiote. See, the symbiote affecting Peter's personality wouldn't be introduced until the black suit arc in the 90s Spider-Man animated series. That story was written by... What? What? What is this, please? Now, I think people were probably expecting this to result in maybe more violent action sequences that make you go, oh, hell yeah. But... You gotta go all in if you want to do this story justice. You've got to make us, the audience, want Peter to give up the black suit. This guy's got to fall hard. And he did. Because this is just... Ouch, man. Like, before this, it was death by a thousand cuts. Now we're just getting chopped up like liver. Sheesh. Peter, man, you suck. God, I, I hate Peter. So Peter takes Gwen Stacy on a date to the jazz club where Mary Jane happens to work and takes this opportunity to humiliate Mary Jane with a very bizarre dance number. And this is where I think, yeah, the movie gets it all a little bit confused. See, again, Peter's making an absolute tool of himself, but the audience find this endearing? Now, you could say that this makes Peter kind of an unreliable narrator in a way, and yes, he does narrate this movie like he did the previous two, but it's not told entirely from his perspective, as the perspective shifts to Mary Jane and Harry Osborn, sometimes Flint, Marco, and Eddie Brock. So we got Peter just looking like an absolute idiot, and everyone just finds it cool? I guess New Yorkers are a different breed after all, I don't know, I just think the tone's a bit off here and this scene is just very unrelenting after the previous one. There's such a thing as too far and I think this is exactly it. He does get into a scuffle with the bouncers, Mary Jane tries to intervene and she gets slapped. 
Now, if John Jameson had done that, I think that'd be okay. I'm obliged to tell the internet that this is a joke for the sake of my fame. And that's the final nail in the coffin. Peter is cancelled. The black suit's gotta go. And so we get our movie poster moment of Spider-Man brooding atop the church tower in the rain before ditching the suit in a scene that takes a highly gothic horror approach, and I love that. This scene will always be iconic, but who else happens to be at this church? None other than Eddie Brock, who, like us in the audience, is praying for Peter Parker to just die. Although, he's pretty unjustified about it, like, mate, all of that was entirely your fault. Eddie hears a ruckus coming from the bell tower and decides to investigate. This is where he gets a face full of goop. Jokes aside, this is such a well-directed, well-shot, and well-scored scene. This is where Eddie Brock becomes Venom. Now then, a few words on Venom. Venom was the source of much of the disappointment towards Spider-Man 3. Not only does he not appear until the final 20 minutes of the film, the character of Venom in the comics by this point had evolved significantly over the couple of decades that he was around for. He'd gone from the pseudo-evil twin character archetype to accentuating the symbiotic relationship between Eddie and the symbiote, referring to themselves with we pronouns, as both Eddie and the symbiote still treated each other as separate entities. Venom was also slowly but surely becoming an anti-hero in the comics at the time. Spider-Man 3's Venom really didn't pull much from how Venom had progressed as a character in the comics, instead just going for much more of a first appearance Venom kind of deal. Zero emphasis on the symbiotic relationship between Eddie and the symbiote, there's no we pronouns, there's no sympathetic angle, but what they did play up was A, how irrational Eddie's hatred for Peter is, especially given that everything that happened to him was entirely his own fault, and B, the idea of Venom as this evil doppelganger to Spider-Man, even down to including webs on his costume just like Spider-Man's. Now, in fairness, this is Venom's very first big screen appearance, so honestly, the idea that he's pulling primarily from Venom's first story well, that's a good place to start with this ca- Oh right, yeah, he died, didn't he? So yeah, all that potential to become a more fully formed version of the character is gone. Either way, I do appreciate what they were going for with the character of Eddie Brock, being every good thing about Peter Parker flipped on its head, a polar opposite. I think Raimi had a thing for the yin-yang character dichotomy. So the third act of this film is very strong in my opinion. Aunt May acknowledges how strange things have been between her and Peter lately and tells him he needs to forgive himself. Peter tries to make amends with Harry but is told to piss off. Sandman survived his battle with Spider-Man and is coerced into teaming up with Venom to take him down once and for all. Venom kidnaps Mary Jane to bait his trap for Spider-Man where the two will ambush him. Harry's butler Bernard finally breaks his silence that it was the gl The Gilder? The trailer? The Glider! that killed Norman and not Spider- Hold the damn phone, Bernard. Is there a reason why you let things get this bad before saying anything? Oh, okay, I can understand being sworn to secrecy about the Green Goblin, but once the secret was out, you couldn't say anything? Did he not know what Harry was up to? Oh, okay, well in that case, actually, you know, as you were, Bernard. Wait, no, 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 you could see Harry was being eaten up by all of this, couldn't you? Although, maybe it's not his place. You know what? As you were, Bernard, as you were. Well, this causes Harry to go in there and fight the good fight alongside Spider-Man. So, we've got Spider-Man, his best friend Harry Osborn, both rescuing MJ from... Okay, what do we got here? We've got the total manifestation of every mistake Peter's ever made, and the kaiju sand form of Uncle Ben's killer. Okay, you gotta admit, that is compelling stuff. And yeah, this fight is truly a bit of compelling cinema, even down to the surrogate audience of New Yorkers who all decided to come out and witness the giant sand monster, who definitely isn't, like, dangerous at all. It really feels like this grand celebration of all three movies, and everything that they've built up to all coming together. It's an incredible sequence. 
Like, almost all of the characters are out in full force here, with even Jameson getting in on the action. It all ends with Mary Jane rescued, the Sandman defeated by Harry, Harry killed by Venom using the blade of his sky stick, Spider-Man using the sound and a pumpkin bomb to defeat Venom, and Sandman explaining what happened on the night of Uncle Ben's death. And it is here where we get a moment of absolute finality absolute catharsis, the logical conclusion to THE Spider-Man story. Peter Parker making peace with the killer of Uncle Ben and forgiving him, recognizing the humanity within. This also causes Sandman to be the only Spider-Man villain in the Raimi trilogy to not eat shit. In his dying breath, Harry forgives Peter, with both of his best friends by his side, and after Harry's funeral, Peter and MJ, these two broken people, meet at the jazz club once more as she takes Peter's hand and the two dance in each other's arms. No triumphant final swing, it's not needed here. This is not that kind of ending. So Spider-Man 3 is a lot. Full disclosure, I don't really set out to do story breakdowns in these videos, but sometimes that foundation really just has to be laid out so that nothing I'm saying is just being screamed out into a vacuum. Narratively, Spider-Man 3 feels a bit more akin to a film like, say, Love Actually, where you've got multiple plots following multiple characters and they all converge. The scale is bigger, it's incredibly ambitious, with easily some of the darkest and most mature subtext that you'll find in any superhero film. As I said with Spider-Man 2, it's the characters that stand at the forefront of these movies above all else, above all of the action and drama. This film focuses on Peter, Harry, and MJ. They are its main characters. Now, it would be quite a stretch for me to say that Spider-Man 3 was as much of a consistent quality as the other two. It can be pretty choppy as it introduces different characters into the mix and does what it can to justify them in a very short space of time. I'd say the end justifies the means, but again, it doesn't change the fact that these introductions were not a particularly smooth ride. Peter, MJ, and Harry all flow into the movie pretty organically, but you can definitely feel the cogs ticking over with Eddie and Flint. A lot of the world building laid down by Spider-Man 1 and 2, such as the Daily Bugle and Mr. Dirkovich, it's all still here, but it plays a bit of a smaller role when compared to Spider-Man 2. Heck, even Spider-Man is less present this time, as far as screen time goes, than he was in the other two. Spider-Man 3 is a film that really can't be viewed passively, as there's a lot of moving parts to keep track of, and a lot of subtext that really needs to be acknowledged in order to get the most out of this film. And honestly, I'm okay with that. It does suffer from a few other issues here and there, particularly on a technical level. They're definitely getting a bit more confident with CGI in this one, and there are numerous shots where you can see that CGI doubles are being used, as opposed to actors on strings or whatever. It's not quite as visually seamless as Spider-Man 2 was in that regard, and even Spider-Man 2 wasn't exactly seamless. I would also say that the first fight between Peter and Harry is the weakest fight scene of the original trilogy. Conceptually, it's great. Peter completely unprepared for a fight, caught off guard, trying to keep hold of the wedding ring, that's all really compelling stuff, but it does sadly fall into visual vomit, particularly in its second half, as the green screen tracking gets a bit ropey. Also, the green screen in Harry's death scene is perhaps just a little too obvious, even though the composition is fantastic. <coughs> At the end of the day, I can look past the visual hiccups here, as the story, characters, and themes are just incredibly engaging. In spite of those flaws, I think Bill Pope has delivered some of the best cinematography of the genre in Spider-Man 3. This is a gorgeous looking film. It's a more mature looking film than its two predecessors, with a generally colder color palette and a higher contrast. Sam Raimi does some really cool stuff with Peter as he stews over the black suit and everything he's going through. It's a nice touch that he rubs his suit under his clothing quite often in this film as a means of indulging it. I don't think this film showcases quite the level of brilliance in directing though as Spider-Man 2 did. Spider-Man 2's action sequences just felt a bit more kinetic, and a bit more in touch with their scale, utilizing more of their environments. Take the first Sandman fight. 
It's an excellent fight while it lasts, but it ends incredibly abruptly. I don't feel like we got the most out of that scene. I would have appreciated a bit more like that. But with that being said, with this film's variety of villains, each action sequence is certainly distinctive, and I do think San Raimi does very cool things with the Sandman, particularly his introductory scene. And as I said, the horror directing in the Venom origin scene, great stuff. Christopher Young steps into the composer's chair with a little help from Danny Elfman, who was either otherwise busy or having a spat with Raimi. You decide what business you want to poke your fly on the wall snoot into. Christopher Young has a slightly grander, less percussive vibe than Elfman. Apologies for my likely misuse of music terminology, I know very little about music, but I have to say, he does just as well with the leitmotifs as Elfman did. He utilizes the toys that Elfman left in him for the toy box beautifully, and his character themes are all fitting. Perhaps the biggest musical takeaway from this film is the black suit theme, which is so iconic that it's received meme status for any time Spider-Man gets even slightly angry. So, Spider-Man 3. It really needs to be said. For the faults that it has, I do think this is still up there with the other two Spider-Man films. It's invested in its characters and its themes. It's a film that's ultimately about good people indulging the worst parts of themselves, taking a dive and learning to live with those mistakes and forgive. Except Venom, he's, he's just evil. Spider-Man 2 was a pretty sad film. Spider-Man 3 is utterly devastating. This film completely succeeds in making me, as an audience member, feel frustrated with Peter Parker. His every mistake, his every loss, his every stumble, you feel it all. And you come away from this film feeling somber. This here is not a man who has overcome the odds like he did in Spider-Man 1 and 2. This is a man who's getting back up and starting again by the end of the film. These characters walk out of this film broken. I think there's a lot of people that walked out of this film feeling those emotions, which I don't think a lot of people wanted to feel, especially after the triumphant, if haunting, note Spider-Man 1 and 2 left the audience off on. Spider-Man 3 has my respect for being so ballsy as to make a superhero film that isn't made to elicit cheers and applause, but a film that has us experience the downfall of the protagonist that we've been rooting for for two movies now. They didn't take the ideal route with Spider-Man 3. They didn't make a crowd-pleasing sequel. They treated Spider-Man's darkest hour with the same sincerity, the same level of emotional maturity as they did in Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 3 is, at the very least in my opinion, an adequate finale. I didn't need to see Tobey Maguire return in Spider-Man No Way Home, although boy am I happy he did. The tension between him and Harry is finally laid to rest with Harry himself as well, rip bozo. He's at peace with the very incident that caused him to become Spider-Man. He's forgiven the killer of Uncle Ben. Spider-Man 3 gives us that closure, and I'm fine with this being the send-off for Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. But that's not the last we would see of Spider-Man 3. Shortly before the release of Spider-Man Homecoming, Sony would release new boxed sets for the Sam Raimi and Mark Webb Spider-Man films, with the Raimi box set being referred to as the Origins Collection. This set would include a brand new cut of Spider-Man 3 10 years after the film's original theatrical release. Now, it's no secret that Spider-Man 3 was absolutely abundant with cut content. However, what's interesting about this cut is that it's shorter than the original. So let's quickly talk about the Spider-Man 3 editor's cut. Now, while this is a shorter cut, there are some new scenes in here. But the main change with this cut is that some of the scenes play out in a very different order, particularly in the film's second act. In this cut, Peter exposes Eddie before he fights Harry in the mansion. Exposing Eddie is now followed up with a new scene of Peter in the black suit in broad daylight swinging home from the Daily Bugle. Peter then goes to fight Harry with some alternative dialogue, giving us a more cocky Peter egging Harry on a little more. And then after the fight where Harry is possibly killed, we then cut to the funky soul montage, which now has a completely different vibe to what it did before, given that it now follows Peter potentially committing murder, and now he's gleefully strutting down the street. It speaks a little more to how Peter has fallen. 
Then we have a scene of Sandman disguised as a sandcastle, as a means of connecting with Penny even when he can't be seen out. He is an escaped con after all. In the editor's cut, after Peter yells at Mr. Ditkovich, it's Ursula that forgives Peter rather than Mr. Ditkovich. And I'm pretty split on that. I think it speaks to the underlying kinship between Peter and Ursula, but at the same time, any scene with Mr. Dikovich is golden, and I love the line about buying him a pizza if he feels so bad. It was good characterization for Mr. Dikovich, and it's a shame it's not here. Another scene that didn't make the cut was the scene where Aunt May tells Peter to forgive himself. Instead, he ventures into the final battle with none of that sense of relief, and the emotions are much more raw because of it. I did like that scene, and it is now sad that the last we see of Aunt May is Peter telling her that he killed Flint Marco. Oh god, man, wow. The story of Peter's life truly is not for the faint of heart, wowee. One of the most pivotal changes is what causes Harry to decide to go into the final battle to help Peter. Rather than Bernard revealing the truth to him at the last minute, Harry instead finds a busted up photo of him, Peter, and MJ all together, and decides to help his friends regardless of all that has happened. Which is a stronger moment for him as a character, I feel. In the theatrical cut, there were various instances where Christopher Young's score was replaced with existing incidental music by Danny Elfman. Here, they've left Christopher Young's score in its entirety, and I have to say, I much prefer it. It gives Spider-Man 3 a more distinct and intimate feel especially the theme he gave to both Peter and MJ whenever they are on screen together, which absolutely fits the idea of these two flawed, broken people trying to make it work. If you ask me, the editor's cut feels a lot less choppy than the original, and is definitely the superior version. There are numerous obvious trigger points in the theatrical cut where a character will have a change of heart. Those have been removed in this one, so the characters come to their own decisions instead, giving them quite a bit more agency. On a whole, Spider-Man 3 is one tenacious film. It's not about catharsis or pleasing the crowd. It's about the fall of Peter Parker, how big of a fall it was, and how far he fell. It's absolutely fair to not like Spider-Man 3 for that reason. If this film makes you absolutely miserable and you don't want that, it's a sign that the film's done its job really damn well and I absolutely respect the crap out of it for it, but I also do get it. What I don't quite agree with is there's a lot of people that do scoff at this one, treating it like it's the silliest one of the bunch because of the funky soul montage, but I really feel like to dismiss it based upon that is really just refusing to acknowledge the subtext or being just downright oblivious to it. Either one really isn't the film's fault. The jazz club scene was a step too far, though, I'll yield there. And I know some folks are going to bring up that Sam Raimi hates this film, but I don't think that adds much to this conversation. Sam Raimi can think what he wants. I love Spider-Man 3. There's very, very little I'd change about it. Is there a drop-off in quality between this and Spider-Man 2? Yes, but it's pretty marginal in my opinion. And Spider-Man 2 really was just lightning in a bottle, on top of what a flawlessly crafted film that is. I do not hold it against Spider-Man 3 that it isn't the greatest movie ever made. And you know what? I do not hold it against any Spider-Man film for not being as good as Spider-Man 2, because Spider-Man 2 is as good as it's gonna get. Expecting any film to top that is just gonna result in disappointment. But with that said, yeah, Spider-Man 3 can be a little choppy, and some of the visuals can be pretty ropey in places. But to me, Spider-Man 3 is still a damn respectable movie, and I absolutely adore it for all of its tenacity. For allowing a superhero film to go beyond just being triumphant and making the crowd happy. I mean, Spider-Man 2 already did that, but I loved when Spider-Man 2 did it, and I love how Spider-Man 3 does it. May 6th, 2011. The day Spider-Man fans would be waiting for since 2007. The release of Spider-Man 4. Despite the wobbly reception of Spider-Man 3, Spider-Man fans were not deterred from speculating and musing about what would be next in store for Spidey. Most commonly speculated were the villains of The Lizard and Carnage. The Lizard felt appropriate given that we'd already shown Dr. Connors in Spider-Man 2 and 3, and Carnage not so much but maybe the idea that some of the symbiotes survived from Spider-Man 3. Either way, this would mark a new chapter for Peter Parker. The dynamic between him and Harry Osborn that served as a driving force of tension in the previous films was now laid to rest. Uncle Ben's killer is now forgiven, 
and Peter and MJ are picking up the pieces of their broken lives. Sam Raimi had stated that he really wanted to focus on quality for Spider-Man 4, admitting that he felt Spider-Man 3 did not release in a desirable state. The wait from May 2007 to May 2011 would feel excruciating were it not cut short by one year, as in January of 2010, the next Spider-Man movie was announced for a 2012 release. The Lizard would be the main villain, Harry Osborn would not be present, but this wasn't Spider-Man 4. This was something completely different. A reboot. However, before we dive into the adventures of a brand new Spider-Man, let's talk about what we know of the ill-fated Spider-Man 4 that never came to be. Mamma mia, you made it this far into the video and you still haven't subscribed? What in the name of spaghetti and meatballs is this all about? Hey, f you boy, why you not subscribe to the channel, pop, yeah? And click on the link in the Patreon in the description below, or I'll f***ing kill you, boy! Don't f***ing test me! That's so unspicy meatball! Yes, it is! Between 2007 and 2010, the cast and crew of the Spider-Man movies weren't just sat about eating Cheetos and playing James Pond Robocop for the Sega Mega Drive. Much work and deliberation was underway, and they seem to have landed on a concept and story that they would be moving forward with, at least so far as to make it to storyboarding, sculpting, and some hypothetical casting choices. Despite rumours of Tobey Maguire's departure after Spider-Man 3, both he and Kirsten Dunst would be returning for Spider-Man 4. Joining the cast would be Felicia Hardy, aka The Black Cat, as portrayed by either Anne Hathaway or Angelina Jolie as well as the Vulture, played by John Malkovich, with scripts being handled by James Vanderbilt, David Lindsay Abair, and Gary Ross. Now, it does need to be made as clear as possible that there are a lot of dots that are not yet connected, given that we do not know who would be responsible for specific drafts of the script, but we do have enough material to piece together a vague, basic plot. That being said, no, the version of Spider-Man 4 that we will be discussing today would never have made it to theatres. After reading through numerous script drafts, Sam Raimi was unable to land on a single draft that he felt happy with, and grew exhausted by the deliberation involved in making a Spider-Man 4. Given that he was still unsatisfied with what he was making, the chances are, if a Spider-Man 4 ever were to make it to the screen, it would likely have very little in common with the story that we are discussing in this video but there is time to theorize about that. What we have here are storyboards by artist Jeffrey Henderson. Henderson worked closely with Raimi on Spider-Man 4 and revealed a small selection of the storyboards that he was allowed to share, stating that Raimi is incredibly superstitious when it comes to the sharing of storyboards. Henderson would say that Spider-Man 4 would have been one absolutely kick-ass movie. He added that from top to bottom, everyone felt that Spider-Man 3 was a bit of a missed opportunity and that they all wanted to help Raimi to take Spider-Man 4 to another level. So that, should it be the end of Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man's adventures, the series could at least go out on a high note. Now look, it is worth noting, whatever my own opinions of the information we have in this video are going forward, I am not in any capacity going to try to argue with Jeffrey Henderson. He knows all about this movie, more about it than myself or any journalist or any YouTuber. The man knows the whole story of this ill-fated movie. I will be showing more of the storyboards as we go through what we currently understand of the story of Spider-Man 4, but for now, we can see here that a new suit was being considered for Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man, one hearkening back a little bit more to the classic Spider-Man, to the Ditko days, something more simple and believably homemade. It would be interesting to see how downgrading to a more convincingly homemade suit in-universe would be explained. Personally though, I think the suit that we have in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films is the definitive suit of the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, and any replacement would really just be a footnote in the grand scheme of things. Heck, I think when most people think movie Spider-Man, the original Raimi Spider-Man suit is the one they're thinking of first. It's the definitive cinematic Spider-Man costume. So let's talk a bit about this plot then. Now, again, this information comes from a slew of different sources and interpretations, so chances are some of this information may be inaccurate, but this is just going off of what we have here, and I'll be giving my thoughts along the way. 
So we've got a bit of a more seasoned Spider-Man now, working his way through the Spider-Man rogues gallery bit by bit, bringing them to justice. In a montage, we'd see Spider-Man bringing Mysterio, as played by Bruce Campbell, to the NYPD, as well as apprehending other enemies, including the Rhino and Shocker. Now, before you cry too many villains, these would all just be quick cameos for characters that they had no larger plans for. Which would be unfortunate, as I think Mysterio would be ripe for the Raimi treatment, but hey, what do I know? This would at least expand Spidey's rogues gallery to include some villains that don't find out Peter's secret identity and don't die. Peter has also finally landed a decent job at Citicorp, working under his boss, Adrian Toomes. Little does Peter know that Adrian Toomes lives a double life as the Vulture, trying to gain control of New York's criminal underworld. It's unknown as to whether or not the Vulture would wear some kind of mask or disguise or something. He certainly doesn't in the artwork. Maybe when he was just Adrian Toomes, he wore a wig or something. I've got no idea. But Peter doesn't seem to know that Adrian Toomes is the Vulture, and nor do the people at Citicorp. On top of this, all is not well between Peter and MJ. Ugh. All right, what do you got for me this time? As Peter's new colleague at City Corp, Felicia Hardy, is stirring up some sensations in the old web-slinger. If you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> leading Peter to have an affair with Felicia. All right, I'm just gonna stop right here to say, if this had happened, worst Spider-Man movie ever. Like, you have two movies of Peter wanting to be with MJ, a third one where he ruins it all, but the two end up willing to forgive, only for Peter to cheat on MJ and Spider-Man 4. That is really a gross way to handle this relationship. Also, I'm really not fond of Peter outright cheating to the extent of having a full-on affair, and no, this would not be some black suit story. After we saw Peter sink horrendously low in Spider-Man 3, I feel like this would just not be palatable in the slightest. It'd be bad enough having our hero Peter Parker be an adulterer, even worse after three movies of him straining himself to find a way to be with MJ. Like, just the whole plot of Spider-Man 2 would just be completely cheapened by this. You know what I could accept though? Spider-Man 3 brought out the worst in Peter. MJ has seen the worst of what he's capable of, how low he can sink. These aren't things that you can just undo. If off-screen Peter and MJ tried to make things work for a little bit, but just couldn't shake what went on in the past and decided to move forward as friends, and then Felicia is his new love interest, making things a tad awkward between Peter and MJ, but not bringing this character to the point of cheating, that'd be far more digestible. I mean, that may well have been how it would have played out. We don't know. Again, misinterpretations can happen. Drafts of scripts do change and evolve over time. I haven't actually been so fortunate as to read this script anyway. So this could be a load of bull honky. Anywho, Felicia, in a twist, happens to be the adopted daughter of Adrian Toomes. So I don't know necessarily how many action sequences there would be between Peter and Vulture. Maybe there'd just be the one and that would explain how Peter doesn't know that Adrian Toomes is the Vulture sooner. But in these storyboards by Jeffrey Henderson, we got lots of action shots. A big helicopter pursuit going after the Vulture. Spider-Man flinging gargoyles at him. Him dropping an unmasked Spider-Man from a great height. Also, check off yet another villain who knows Spider-Man's secret identity. Even so, these action sequences looked really cool. And at some stage in the middle of the film, Spider-Man and Vulture would have a climactic battle atop the City Corp building. We've got these animatics here which showcase easily the most brutal fight Spider-Man would have ever had on the big screen. Vulture just brutalizing Spider-Man atop the shattering glass ceiling at Citicorp, as the horrified staff, including Felicia, bear witness. Spider-Man has shards of glass poking out of his back. It's incredibly violent. Vulture impales Spider-Man in the shoulders with one of his wing blades, twisting it to torture the web-slinger. Ready to finally go in for the kill, Spider-Man manages to break the blade, push Vulture off with him landing on a vertical pipe, partially impaled. Vulture then flies off to his death, Felicia having witnessed all of it. So I'm guessing either Felicia recognized her father as the Vulture, or she just knew already. Drama. But killing off the main villain halfway into the film? That's pretty out there. I'm kind of impressed by that. So now believing Spider-Man to have killed her father, Felicia Hardy dons the identity of the Vultress to avenge her now deceased... 
Wait a minute, where have I heard this before? Did they really just speed run through the Norman and Harry arcs in the original trilogy? Well, that's a little derivative, don't you think? In a final battle, Voltress has Peter defeated but chooses to spare him. She then moves to Europe for some reason. And after discovering that Peter cheated on her, Mary Jane moves to LA to pursue an acting career. Realizing there's nothing left to do now and ready to start again, Peter gives up being Spider-Man and finally moves on. So all things considered, there are small elements here that I like and could in some ways be reworked. Putting Peter and MJ's relationship to bed would be a smart move, but definitely smarter at the beginning of the film, allowing MJ to go off on her own and be her own person. Yes, Mary Jane is Peter's endgame. She's the definitive love interest, but let's be real, Raimi's MJ is a very different person from comic MJ. She's much more complicated, and her relationship with Peter is too. There aren't a great deal of ways that those two could really work, but she's also Peter's very first love, and so much has happened between the two of them. Not to mention that Peter's love for her always felt a bit more like infatuation than anything else. Plus, Marvel Comics editorial really doesn't seem to agree with the fans that MJ is Peter Parker's endgame. You can pull him apart all we want. You can introduce as many Pauls and as many kids as you want. It's not going to work. MJ is Peter's definitive love interest. Either way, I think a fresh start for both Raimi Peter and Raimi MJ would be a really good place to go for both of them. The idea of ending Spider-Man 4 with Peter having at last moved on from the pursuit of Mary Jane and Spider-Man, the world now his oyster, his life ready to begin, it's a fair place to end things. That said, allegedly there were hopes for a fifth and sixth Spider-Man sequel at Sony, so this would be an especially awkward continuation from Spider-Man 3. After Spider-Man 3, Peter and MJ's relationship either needs to be moved to the background in a healthy place or put to bed entirely. An affair would have been a horrendous way to go that would undermine the relationship that stood at the forefront of the previous three films. An affair cheapens it. Growing apart doesn't. And if Peter were to just have this affair, it would just make him immensely unlikable. After a film where the whole point of the film was that Peter becomes unlikable before redeeming himself. As mentioned before as well, Vulture and Voltress feels incredibly similar to what was done with the Green Goblin and the New Goblin. Except here, we don't have three films to get to know these characters. In terms of Spider-Man villains cameoing in a montage, it's one of those things where if these cameos were a complete surprise, It'd be sweet, but if they were to officially announce, say, Bruce Campbell as Mysterio only for it to be a mere cameo, well, hey, I know that Venom fans were left disappointed by Venom's 15 minutes of screen time in Spider-Man 3. Mysterio is my favorite comic book villain. Imagine my disappointment if they advertised Mysterio and it were just a cameo. Sony are kind of known for giving these things away in marketing as well. Sure, they kept Venom somewhat close to their chest in Spider-Man 3, but they still showed Peter ditching the black suit in the trailers, meaning that, yeah, as soon as you sat down in the cinema, you knew that black suit wasn't a permanent fixture. I mean, hey, if you have any familiarity with Spider-Man, you know it's not a permanent fixture, but, you know, movies can be different, and you're not making these things strictly for the fans either. All right, enough ranting about Spider-Man 3's trailer. As it stands, you can make these things work, but honestly, I wasn't too fond of this version of Spider-Man 4 conceptually, and if this is what Sam Raimi was saying no to, I completely get it. I'd probably say no to it too. It must have come along to at least a small degree though, as we have this stunning image here of a maquette depicting John Malkovich in the Vulture costume. Once again, a very comic faithful design in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man universe, with the only real deviation design-wise being the new Goblin, but even so, it was more of an original character kind of incarnation of Green Goblin than anything else. Also courtesy of comic writer Ken Penders, Yes, that Ken Penders. We have this image of a practical vulture wing prop being made. So even if this wouldn't be the story they'd go with, they did get to some actual practical props for the vulture. 
Now, ditching the Black Cat persona in favor of Voltress was also a bizarre decision. Why not just make Vulture's daughter an entirely new character in that case? At least someone not burdened with the expectation of becoming a fan-favorite vigilante. Well, I guess plans really do change, as Sam Raimi did go on to say later down the line that Black Cat and Spider-Man would work together as a team. So, presumably, yeah, the Vulture's angle either got reworked or ditched. Still, the idea of Vulture getting killed off at the midway point of the film? I don't hate that idea. Although, okay, a few things. It would be Spider-Man's action here that would inadvertently lead to the Vulture's death. This isn't like being killed by his own attack or him jumping into a pumpkin bomb explosion. This is Spider-Man kicking the Vulture off of a building to save his own life. I doubt this would have sat too well with people. However, I mean, what choice does Peter really have here? And it's not like Spider-Man had the intent to kill Vulture here either, just to push him off. Perhaps we shouldn't have Spider-Man and Vulture in such a violent fight, or such a do-or-die situation. But at the same time, I fully support these storytellers testing the limits of these characters. The angle of this, though, that I would take issue with is yet another Spider-Man villain gets offed. I think by the time Spider-Man 4 would roll around, we'd definitely start to see a formula emerge and certain plot points growing a lot more tired. The tradition of the villain uncovering Peter's identity, them dying, them having some kind of personal connection to Peter before they become villains, a pattern was definitely starting to emerge around Spider-Man 3, and it probably would have grown pretty stale by Spider-Man 4. Looking back at Henderson's storyboards, I think the best thing about Spider-Man 4 would have been the aerial battles between between Spider-Man and Vulture. The stakes are always high when you're fighting in the sky. Eh. Also in development was a Spider-Man 4 video game, with different development studios working on the versions for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, and the Wii version separately. Production on these games would have begun pretty much as soon as Spider-Man 4 was announced. The procedure for Spider-Man movie tie-in games went in a way that a Spider-Man game would be made with a small selection of villains who would not appear in the film, and then the film's villains would be added to the game last as production of the film nears its end, so that you don't end up with contradictions between the games and the movies themselves. And from the looks of things, the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 version of this game was focusing a lot on aerial combat, as Spider-Man takes like 20 minutes to defeat a helicopter. This engine would go on to be used in the prototype game series, so it wasn't all a massive waste. Fasting forward, in an interview with The Rolling Stone in early 2022 around the release of the Raimi-directed Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Sam Raimi stated that while Vulture was considered for Spider-Man 4, he did have other ideas in mind for Kraven the Hunter and Mysterio, hinting possibly at maybe a slightly larger role for Bruce Campbell, but also stating that Spider-Man is an agile trickster of the sky and Kraven is the ultimate hunter. So I'm thinking that could lead to a unique dichotomy between Spider-Man and the villain, facing off against someone less physically powerful than himself, but more tactical. So this would give us a little insight as to later versions of Spider-Man 4 and how they were shaping up. This may also give a little credence to a rumor that Mr. Ditkovich would turn out to be a retired Kraven the Hunter. I'd hate that. Raimi has said that letting go of Spider-Man 4 was pretty devastating for him, and it's something that he thinks about still to this day. Following the release of Spider-Man No Way Home in 2021, many fans began speculating a possible return to Spider-Man for Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire. While no plans are in place, Sam Raimi has said that he'd be all too happy to return with Tobey Maguire in tow, who has also expressed interest in returning. Does this mean that a Spider-Man 4 is likely? Well, there's certainly money to be made. It all just depends on how willing Marvel Studios and Sony Pictures are to have more than one live-action Spider-Man in theaters, and how it would work with Sony and Marvel Studios and their agreement for how Spider-Man is used. To me, it sounds like so soon after Spider-Man 3, Sam Raimi was feeling a lot of pressure to really get Spider-Man 4 as good as he could, and that pressure will have only made proceedings rockier and rockier. Now, over a decade after Spider-Man 4 was slated to release, thinking optimistically, perhaps Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire would be ready to take us for at least one more ultimate spin. Time will tell.
At the same time, I've said myself that I personally felt that Spider-Man 3 was a great ending to the franchise, and a much better ending than what we discussed today, if that ever came to be. But not everyone feels the same as I do. I think I may even be in the minority on that one. So, it's understandable why Spider-Man fans would still be pining for a fourth feature film. With that said, fortunately, and obviously to anyone who hasn't been living under a rock these past couple of years, Spider-Man 3 was not the last we'd see of Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker, which we will discuss later in the retrospective. But at the same time, this wasn't the last we'd see of a few plot threads from Spider-Man 4 either. Whether or not this was intentional, there are a few similarities between Spider-Man 4 and the first entry to the MCU Spider-Man's adventures, Spider-Man Homecoming, where Vulture is the main adversary and the love interest Liz Allen is revealed to be the daughter of Adrian Toomes. Shocker also factors into this one, as he was going to have a cameo in Spider-Man 4. Now, if you really want to see an adaptation of Spider-Man 4 as we understood it, you might just be in luck, as a crowdfunded Spider-Man 4 project by High Mountain Studios seeks to adapt and bring a lot of the original Spider-Man 4's ideas to life in the form of a fan film. No, it won't include Tobey Maguire. No, it isn't directed by Sam Raimi, but it's a labor of love from the fans to the Raimi Spider-Man universe and might just be a means of seeing this story brought to life, albeit in a lower budget capacity. Remember, be realistic with your expectations. It's not necessarily going to be up to Hollywood standards, but fan films are still absolutely worth checking out purely for the love and creativity that can go into them. For now, that's where we close the book on Spider-Man 4. I would love to return to the subject of Spider-Man 4 someday with an actual tangible movie that I can watch, but for now, we can only speculate. So what do you guys think? What do you think about Spider-Man 4? What do you think of this video? Comment below and discuss. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button. And if you want your name in the credits of all my videos, you can do so by pledging a single dollar on my Patreon. Link is in the description below. And now for the patrons donating $10 or more a month, the literal shout outs. Ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Bennett, Dick Jordan, King K, Legendary Ray Ray, Adam Myers, Mr. Doctor S, Brain Doctor S, Pendering, Sergio, and so is the skeptic. And for those in the five dollar tier, we have SSS06, Dazzle Fizzle, and Council of Geeks. Thank you, folks, so much for your unbelievable generosity. And as for the rest of you out there, thank you so much for watching, guys and have a great day.